I've never met Dan Harmon in person, but he seems to me like kind of a jerk. Like in his documentary, you can see him treating people who care about him really poorly, and I also had a weird run-in with him on Twitter once, where he blocked me the same night he was railing and railing against a kid fan of his for an offhand comment. But since he wasn't my friend and I had no real personal connection to him, him insulting me didn't bother me at all and had no impact on my continued consumption of his work. I still really love early community and Rick and Marty is a fantastic show and I don't think about him being rude online or whatever when I watch it. Even if I do think it's really dumb and petty to publicly go in on some finished teen with a bird person avatar for jokingly calling you drunk. It lowered my opinion of him, but I don't know him personally or pretend to know him personally. Maybe he's great. I don't know. Who cares? And the joy I get from Rick and Morty pretty easily outweighs all of that. It's a brilliant show that taps into my sensibilities in a rare way and resonates with me a lot, and my exposure to him has in no way detracted from that enjoyment. I also used to really love Louie, and I enjoyed Stand Up by its showrunner and star, Louis C.K. He seemed like an honest and introspective artist, and his work really hit me deep. Duckling Part 2 moved me to tears, like happy tears, and as someone who is often unemotional, that's impressive. I've only happy cried a couple of times in my life, so for a sitcom to do that is incredible. But then, you know, I start reading allegations about how Louis C.K. treats women, about him cornering women in a locked hotel room and masturbating at them. And I see him responding in really bizarre and evasive ways to the allegations, including saying this. Well, you can't touch stuff like that. There's one more thing I want to say about this, and it's important. If you need your public profile to be all positive, you're sick in the head. I do the work I do, and what happens next I can't look after. So my thing is that I try to speak to the work whenever I can. Just to the work, and not to my life. Which is a really weird way to respond to those kinds of allegations. And then I hear from young comics I know in person that it's kind of an open secret in the industry. The way creeps in positions of power in any industry are open secrets are what are called missing stares. A term for someone who is predatory or dangerous who has enough clout that people work to accommodate them and work around them rather than quote unquote fix them. Now I have not talked to anyone who has directly interacted with Louis C.K. about him. It's not like I'm friends with famous named comics who have toured with him or that he ever personally cornered me and pulled his dick out. All I have are second or third hand accounts and even then the people who this allegedly happened to are unwilling to go on the record about it so I don't even really technically have their word and I'm not going to name the comics I know who told me about stories about it in confidence. I do think from what I've read and what I've heard though that the allegations are at least partially probably true and when the realization that someone who made art that resonated with me was probably a creep it felt like a gut punch like a deep violation or like a betrayal which in a way is very silly because I never met him or interacted with him I only had a parasocial relationship with him and with a fictionalized version of himself on TV and in his jokes I did actually briefly interact with Dan Harmon and he was arguably kind of a jerk to me but that was more of a weird anecdote than anything and I don't blame him for it or care Rick and Morty still rules but the Louis thing got to me. I quit watching his show. I couldn't watch it and enjoy it now if I wanted to. Nobody in my industry has cornered me and pulled their dick out or anything that extreme, but I have had people much older than me and in positions of power over me and my career get weird and creepy and I've watched as people and in institutions supported them or turned a blind eye. It's a really horrible, really crushing feeling and to come to the realization that an artist I admired probably made other women feel like that, feel helpless and violated, is rough. I don't want to give someone like that or their art my time or my attention or my money no matter how funny they are. And I can't help but wonder if other big comics whose work I love and admire who work with CK also know. I bet they do. And if they're just like the people who protected people who are creepy to me. I bet they are. Roman Polanski drugged and raped a 13 year old girl. It's not a hazy secondhand tabloid story or a story where I have to keep saying words like allegations and probably. It's taken as a fact. He still has a career. Men and women in his industry defended him, including men and women whose work I really love and admire. A problematic person and a problematic piece of media are two different things. Like, I'm sure there are people who never pulled their dick out or raped anybody who have made stuff I would consider harmful, unfunny, edgelord garbage, and there are people who are abusive and sleazy who make great work that has made me laugh or cry and has never in and of itself alienated or belittled anyone. But I do think a lot of people handle both of them in a less than ideal way, and I wanted to talk about my perspective on it as a feminist and as a progressive who has also enjoyed irreverent and transgressive material and the people who produce that material. I might do a more academic video in the future on this that involves more research and in-depth cultural analysis, but for now here is a video focused primarily on my own personal views and experiences, what people and what ideas have shaped those views, and generally how I have come to handle problematic media and individuals. I also put this together in part because I got a few questions about it and I wanted to elaborate on my answers. I've talked on Twitter and my Curious Cat about how I used to post on 4chan and how I've always been drawn to people into communities that are irreverent and unfiltered. I prefer blunt honesty to politeness, and I think niceness is often a cover, and that ignoring the dark aspects of life is dishonest and doesn't at all fit in with my own life experiences. There's a great AV Club piece about shows like Rick and Morty and Bojack Horseman and the Venture Brothers called The Art of Cynical Sincerity, about how these shows use other, more challenging but still affecting veins of emotion versus typical saccharine sitcom tropes. 
It's subversion and irony and borderline nihilism, but it's done in the service of painfully affecting an honest art, and a lot of my favorite media tends to toe that line in the same way a lot of my favorite people and people I'm close to share a similar outlook. I think because I am a progressive and because my work is overtly positive and welcoming, people read a lot into my personality that isn't necessarily there. For example, people have been surprised that I'm a fan of something like Red Letter Media. I know a lot of people who are kind of disgusted with RLM and their jokes at the expense of trans people and Asian people and so on. And I do take issue with some of their stances and jokes, and I mean publicly and openly take issue. But I've been a fan of theirs since 2010. They're funny, and they're insightful, and they care a lot about film and filmmaking. And they both gave me media that made me feel much less alone as a morbid weirdo, and influenced my sense of humor and my editing style. A small percentage of their jokes being offensive to me doesn't negate the fact that their material otherwise delights me and makes me feel less alone. I also think it's immature and unnecessary and alienating that the people on the Chavo Trap House podcast use the word retard and make fun of autistic people, and I'm pretty public about that too, but I still love Chapo. Those are both instances where I can totally understand why people would avoid their word because of some of the material. Like, that's completely fair, and I have no interest in convincing people to watch or listen to stuff that bothers them, but for me, the majority of their work brings something positive to my life, and I feel like the good pretty easily outweighs the bad. It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia touches on a lot of taboo topics. I don't think I can eat this guy. Oh, no, I don't think I can, right? What mm -mm. is that? I don't, I don't know. It's not because he's black, though, what? right? Okay. No, I well, no, I just don't think so. But I've almost never felt like they were punching down or being cruel to marginalized groups in their jokes, and it's the funniest TV show I've ever seen and one of my all-time favorites. In The Guardian, Glenn Howerton said, The way the show is described often is, wow, these guys don't care. But that's not true. I don't think the show would work if it were truly hateful. It's one thing for the characters to be misinformed, ignorant, or bigoted. It's another thing for the show to be misinformed, ignorant, or bigoted. And we try not to shy away from jokes that might make people uncomfortable, but never at the expense of being sensitive to people's real life experience. I also watch SVU, which is basically rape culture, the show, and I enjoy a lot of popular edgelord YouTubers like Filthy Frank, real name George Miller. Have you seen an alien? Have you seen an alien, please? Have you seen a ship? And I dubs. <laughs> My enjoyment of SVU is mostly ironic, but I legitimately laugh at and enjoy the YouTube channels Who the hell are you? Last time I was on Earth, I was chased away by the humans Despite a ton of racist and homophobic slurs and pretty overtly anti-feminist rhetoric Though to be clear, it's almost always supposed to be taken as it's a joke bro, edgelord goofiness It's like impossible to take it seriously Not any actual alt-right, white supremacist, etc. rhetoric Which I would find repulsive and unwatchable but I still think it's dumb and disappointing and a bad influence on their fan base. Howerton and others involved in Sunny own their responsibility and make a distinction between characters saying something that might potentially offend some people or make them uncomfortable versus being purposefully offensive or lacking empathy and sensitivity in what they're doing. So you're, I mean, is your kind of, your style is very anti-PC. Is that by intention or are you just expressing it, yourself? It is by intention. The quote of the show is, you know, like uh, equally prejudiced, you know, ever, everyone gets shit, you know, you can't get away at all if you're watching the show, like you're gonna get offended one way or another. This is in stark contrast to how Miller and I dubs evade responsibility by saying what they're doing is just a character or just a reference or whatever. I mean, when, when I've talked to you, uh, it doesn't seem that <laughs> you hold any of the beliefs that you sort of espouse <laughs> as filthy Frank yeah, on, on I camera. Yeah, and, and, and I dub specifically is absolutely and arguably much, much more regressive and harmful than anything Arlem or Chapo or Sonny would ever see or do, regardless of how he hides behind it being just a joke. His moments of self-awareness are criticism of bigotry and hypocrisy in others. All we care about is news. Personal attacks and harassment is totally new just serve to make his borderline sociopath edge lord white dude who says the n-word stick that much more grating. But sometimes when I need a laugh, there is nothing like watching two men in a storm drain eating rotisserie chicken. I can't believe that you can just crawl in the sewer and find chicken like this. Dude, it's it's a lot easier than people think. Or a crawfish race. Or they're really over-the-top gross-out videos that are basically jackass but for nihilistic millennials, which I love. My wife is leaving me for a man named Esteban. He wears the same tank top every day. And despite the slurs and the sort of animal abuse and whatever, I do think it's healthy to watch stuff outside of my comfort zone or stuff made by people who disagree with me, especially if it makes me laugh. Some of their work is genuinely funny and creative and insightful, and in out-of-character interviews, they seem thoughtful and introspective. This feels mean. Yeah, this feels yeah. mean. This feels mean. I thought it's planned for this to be funnier. The old, old Filthy Frank videos, like those were like just straight up, you know, offensive. Like there'd be like just racism, like misogyny, just like fat shaming and stuff. And you know, I, I, I legitimately do like feel bad about that kind of stuff 
like because you know i was i was like still very young when i was doing those videos i was i was a kid now like i i'm i'm trying to stay away from just direct you know like hate speech like abusive comedy and i've like just tried to do like diff like still be offensive but like in different ways you know like if you if you watch like my more recent videos there's not much like racism or misogyny it's more vomit and dead animals that actually is that reminds me of vidcon if you ever to go to go to vidcon mm -hmm. you're gonna meet some familiar faces oh, at yeah, that no, event i'm scared we've never yeah. been to any of those you might want events. to <laughs> you, it's a humbling experience the whole thing was a very positive experience and i'm glad i it, it and the reason i before i said it was humbling and it really was it was like i felt very uncomfortable because i had made this video about him and i was like I'm deserving. It's one of the reasons that I kind of dislike some of the commentary channels out there is that when they go in really hard, I'm like, you need to interact with these people mm -hmm. that you make fun of in real life just to be reminded of what you're actually doing kind right, of thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, so interacting with Rafi. When you see his face and you're like, and then you recall this is real all life. the yeah, terrible things you said about person. him. And you're like, fuck. Like, exactly. This, yeah. And this it, is real life. He felt this shit. Yeah. yeah. I the 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 internet wall is no longer there. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. five feet away from him. Yeah. yeah. It, it becomes real. I can't straight up recommend any iDubs videos overall, though. Like I think my enjoyment of his stuff wouldn't carry over to most people I know, and I think he does a lot of harm. Nigger faggot isn't the slogan. Oh. The slogan is "Hey, that's pretty good." Yeah, come on. Uh, Nigger faggots. That's a character. You've just got so many catchphrases. Yeah. <laughs> and wish he'd grow up and not rely on easy, hateful jokes. Yeah, but the the I'm gay thing. I mean, that I'm proud of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm definitely proud of that. But it would be disingenuous and dishonest to pretend I don't watch his videos and Miller's just as much as I watch or listen to leftist content like ContraPoints or H Bomber Guy or Chapo, or less overtly political videos that still criticize misogyny, racism, and rape culture the way Red Letter Media does. Oh no! 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 Oh, no! no! No, no! Oh, no! No, she's not awake! She's not awake! her crutch! Part of my hesitancy to recommend him, too, on top of the fact that it's horrifically immature and damaging to throw around slurs all the time on a basic human decency level, that exposure to this kind of material, even in the form of jokes, emboldens people who are deeply bigoted and desensitizes others to bigoted rhetoric. Recently, I've been getting a lot of criticism regarding uh, derogatory terms towards homosexuality. Words like faggot and gay and just other words that aren't very, uh, very, very good. I'm deeply upset at myself for saying such hurtful words. I hear screaming down the hallways because you're gay. You're a giant faggot. You should kill yourself. Is it's my experience that no matter how funny he is, the white dude who uses the n-word in a jokey, ironic way in casual conversation probably has some kind of issue with empathy. And I seriously mean in my experience, as in I've had fallings out with people like that multiple times in my life, after a period of wearing rose-colored glasses and making excuses for it and ignoring it. A big factor in why I quit talking to these people is essentially the same reason I quit going on 4chan. Violation of norms is fun and exciting until you realize that in abandoning some norms, a lot of people abandon all of them, including the idea of treating people with kindness and compassion and empathy. JT Sexkick is a video essayist on YouTube who, despite differing from me a lot politically and in a sense of humor, had a very similar experience to mine, which he talked about in his essay, Why I Left 4chan, A Tale of Suspense. Now, um, the problem with having a bunch of people who hate themselves all congregating en masse with no rules should be obvious. If you, if you have bad self-esteem and you don't trust your own judgment and you have a hard time opening up to people and you hang out with people who will tell you to put your head in the microwave for using Windows Media Player instead of MPC, it's probably going to make you even more withdrawn and insecure. And, uh, and more generally, hanging around in a community where that kind of thing is the norm is going to influence your personality and make you, as an individual, a more bitter and judgmental person. And now you might say, oh, that's not true. I'm not like that. It's just a website. I'm me. I am separate from that. But that's just not true. Really, you should ask yourself, would I be the same person today if I had never found 4chan? It's not possible to let your brain marinate in this, like, piss mist of hostility and bad attitudes for hours and hours and not have it influence you on some level. It just is not possible.
I do think, jokingly, using slurs and harboring deep fears about groups of people are different things, but I also think they're both pretty bad and harmful and embarrassing and just different points on the continuum of red flags and bigoted behavior. They feed into each other. And it's one thing to disregard norms in favor of your own personal definitions of what is right. I do that, and I think anyone who actually cares about trying to be a good person shouldn't just mindlessly follow their culture's norms or the norms of whatever subgroups they belong to. But there's a difference between being irreverent and completely lacking empathy and saying whatever you want regardless of how it will affect people than pretending anyone who criticizes you is a villain set out to destroy your free speech. I really don't like being limited. I'm a big fan of freedom of speech. And First Amendment is number one. Yeah. Sex Kick also made an essay called This Video is Problematic about social justice warriors, and I watched it after enjoying his 4chan essay even though the title gave me more than a little pause. Just using the term SJW is a pretty big red flag to me, and with a lot of stuff frothing at the mouth about the SJW menace, I'm the target by virtue of being a woman on the left regardless of how extreme my views actually are. I mean, like, look at me. But I was really pleasantly surprised by his essay because he takes a very reasoned, objective approach and cares more about sincere analysis than owning feminists or whatever. He even takes the time to parody the people I'm talking about. I should say before I start that this isn't really going to be me being like, Welcome to the anti-PC zone, bitches. <laughs> Checkmate, atheists. <laughs> I'm not here to lay the rhetorical smackdown. I'm more interested in, um, in just figuring out what it is that makes these people tick. Who are they? What do they want? Why do they want it? And hopefully we'll all walk away a little bit smarter. He's also a little quick to dismiss actual issues and phenomena marginalized people deal with, and I think his use of boobs as a joke is dumb and demeaning. But those are arguments for another time, and even though I disagree on some points and methods, I overall see where he is coming from. In his essay, Sexkick describes the concept of integrative complexity. Quote, a measure of to what degree your thinking factors in alternate perspectives and possibilities. In the context of politics, an integratively complex thinker sees shades of gray and acknowledges other viewpoints and moral values, while an integratively simple thinker sees in black and white and dismisses other viewpoints as stupid, evil, or illegitimate. Now, this doesn't mean that an integratively complex thinker can't have opinions. It's not like, oh, everybody's right, let's all join hands and dance around the maypole. It's just a question of being able to tell the difference between the world as it is and the world according to your values. I've met people who meet these two criteria who, as far as I'm concerned, were not really social justice warriors. There's a key element that's missing here. And he characterizes SJWs as identity politics focused leftists with low integrative complexity, and he talks about how they use echo chambers to exclude material they find challenging or offensive. Because of the constantly increasing ease with which we are able to connect with like-minded people, we're getting caught up in the norms and ideas of smaller and smaller and more finely differentiated social clusters. It's parochialism on a global scale. My perspective on this is that when you're talking about hypersensitive internet subcultures, this is not solely a facet of the left. Not that Sex Geek says it is, but if you Google terms like SJW, Snowflake, Safe Space, whatever, you'll find thousands of posts from edgelords and alt-right types who want you to think leftists are the only people who are hypersensitive to jokes and criticism, but that's not true. George Miller talked about how his audience is all for the racist jokes, like bring on the racist jokes, as long as they're not about white people. A lot of the fans expect me to like, you know, take their side you know, and be like, like, yeah, you know, like whatever, like go against whatever they don't like, but yeah, then they don't, they don't like feminism. Yeah. So they want you to come on and just be yeah. like, but, this feminism shit. But what they, what they don't get about, about the show is I'm going to, you know, I'm offend. I'm supposedly, I, I I'm going to offend everybody one time, you know, like, obviously I'm going to, I'm going to get at white people. I remember as soon as I made a, a white joke, like something about like, rednecks fucking their sisters or something, yes, something I like that. I remember that. Something joke. like that. Everyone lost their shit and they, they like started making these like really passive aggressive, uh, like comments. And it was like, like they were like coming back with like snarky remarks and like, they've never done this before. And I was just like, wait a minute. Wait, let, let, let me guess. Did they Holocaust jokes are great. You know, love Holocaust jokes, but Pearl Harbor jokes, that's offensive. Everyone's always making Holocaust jokes. Right. And, you know, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, well, there is, but like, you know, a <laughs> Holocaust joke here and there, like, you're not like really like, well, I mean, if other factors are involved, but you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm up for like a good, good Holocaust joke. If it's in uh, not good taste, but not as not like just deliberately like, haha, like Nazis, you know, if I, it's hard to explain, but like, you know, like people are always like making Holocaust jokes at me. And then I made one 
Pearl Harbor joke, hmm. right? And everyone lost their shit because I'm Japanese, I guess. Well, like, well that's know. the thing. A lot of people who, and, and not that they're dishing it out. The thing is, you know, they sort of watch your videos and they kind of feel like they're vicariously dishing it out through you, you know? And, and, and the people, a lot of people who love to dish that shit out cannot take it. Everyone is a target as long as it's not me. Either everything is offensive or nothing is, and nothing is offensive apart from jokes that disrupt my worldview or target or criticize me. I get to say whatever I want about whoever I want, but if anything is remotely critical of me, it's the SJW PC white genocide police here to take me to language jail. Bo Burnham, in his appearance on WTF with Mark Maron, talks about how he regrets a lot of his earlier material because he saw the potential it had to be used as a bludgeon to bully people. And then, uh, you know, they kept going. I found, like, offensive humor, and I was being offensive. There's some things that I'm very ashamed of. What was the of. third song? Uh, one of them was something I'm... Uh, kind of causes me a lot of... Uh, well, okay. It was a series of Helen Keller jokes that was basically like, Helen Keller's the perfect woman. I was 16 and a half. Yeah. And uh, basically just made a bunch of deaf jokes. And like, it really, even now... Wasn't like, she blind? Yeah, also. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, there's some, you know, there's like some gags about like, you know, her reading my acne or something. And uh, like, and, like I've lost sleep thinking about like some little deaf kid, you know, that like... Have, got, you, have you ever gotten any feedback along those I, lines? I haven't. I haven't. But I, you know, it has like three or four million views and the idea that there was a deaf kid that like... Another kid quoted my song to him, made him feel shitty. Quoted to him in sign? Yeah, so, some sort of, uh, <laughs> some sort of, uh, mm -hmm. that, or, or just, you know, made fun of a kid. But that's out bag. there. That's an interesting pr problem. To it is out with. there. It is out there. And, and that humor is out there. And the best thing I can do is learn from it and, and, and go forward. And I was young. And I still am young, but I was very young at that time. High and, school uh, kid. Yeah, I, I mean, I was 16 and a half. I had no idea really what I was doing. Jonathan Dim, who died recently and who directed Silence of the Lambs, said this of criticism of the film. And I know criticism of the film, especially more recent criticism, covers more than his portrayal of gay men, but I feel like his heart's in the right place, so... When the film was accused of continuing a history of stereotypical negative portrayals of gay characters, that was a wake-up call for me as a filmmaker and as a person. My gay friends who love Silence of the Lambs, including my friend Juan Botas, who was one of the inspirations for Philadelphia, said, You can't imagine what it's like to be a 12-year-old gay kid, and you go to the movies all the time, and whenever you see a gay character, they're either a ridiculous comic relief caricature or a demented killer. It's very hard growing up gay and being exposed to all these stereotypes. That registered with me in a big way. That year, we got a number of awards from the New York Film Critics Circle, and at a certain point in the awards ceremony, a dozen young people came into the room with flyers and put them on all the tables, and they said, stop negative portrayals of gays on film. I thought, this is such a bonus, because the film is this big success, and it's now become a part of the dialogue on stereotypical portrayals of gays in movies. The McElroys... <sighs> Where's all the peepus? Oh, oh yeah! ...are also really good about taking the potential harm of their jokes into consideration and learning and growing with their fan base. In a recent TV Insider interview, they said, You fuck up a whole lot when you start doing a podcast. And you hear from people who really, really, really like you. Who let you know very politely that you hurt their feelings and ostracize them. And then you stop doing it. And then after enough of those, you kind of stop doing it to everybody. Or you try your fucking best to. Literally, that's it. I think it's easy to get defensive, but I just always felt so miserable when I heard I'm a big fan of yours and you hurt my feelings. When someone tells you, hey, what you just did hurt me, you have two options. One is to say like, you're wrong and I didn't do anything wrong. Or your other option is to say, okay, well, if you feel that way, let me take a step back and really look at what I did. Do that second one every time. I think doing anything that has a big enough audience these days becomes a lesson in empathy. The show and me, Griven, as a person, have gotten so much better since those lessons have come pouring in. I like having that relationship with our audience, and I genuinely think it's funnier to not say no to shit, or not slam people, instead of getting on board with them. I think that's the funnier thing 100% of the time. It's harder, but it's always funnier. Like it or not, this lesson in empathy is a responsibility anyone, especially anyone with a large teenage fan base that they make a living off of, has and should be aware of. Much of Miller's and iDubbbz' content has the same potential Burnham was worried about. iDubbbz has repeatedly said that it's either all okay or none of it's okay. And Miller has taken a very let's offend everyone approach in his work as well. I feel like this is a stance taken by a lot of people, but it's a cop out that absolves them of any responsibility and shields them from any form of introspection or analysis of who they could be hurting with what they're doing. It's not difficult to offend people and it doesn't make you brave or better than people who are trying to navigate media and comedy with empathy rather than using a shotgun spread on any targets that pop up. You can't pretend that these guys and guys like them don't have a huge impact on internet culture and that internet culture doesn't shape the views and behavior of millions 
millions of kids. I love that I can just say <laughs> nigger faggot though. Kids kill themselves in real life because of homophobic bullying and this kind of stuff and the way it acclimates kids to slurs and drains their empathy doesn't help. Kill yourself. Yeah, please, please, kill yourself. Kill yourself. You should kill yourself. You should kill yourself. You should kill yourself. You should kill yourself. Uh. I never told anyone to kill themselves or anything like that, but I did use that jokey slur kind of language on message boards as a teenager with my friends. And I didn't stop jokingly saying faggot and retarded online because I was scared of the repercussions. I stopped because I realized it was hurting people and had the capacity to hurt more people. Again, people kill themselves because of feeling alienated and it's a facet of a larger culture that discriminates against and is violent towards people who are different. I'm not a perfect person or a better person than someone else for my language choices. Like, I'm not trying to high horse here. I just know that I used to talk like that and stop talking like that or rationalizing it as just a joke because I had no interest in contributing to anything that made people feel like they're not welcome in the world. I have no interest in being a bully. And when you punch down, even if you think you aren't hurting anyone and you don't actually believe what you're saying or it's just a joke or you're playing a character or whatever, you are being a bully. If you want to keep doing it, then you're obviously allowed to, like whatever, but you need to at least come to terms with how you're contributing to a massive empathy void and how what you're doing could have legitimate consequences from making the culture at large more exclusionary to tangible negative effects on someone's life. I think the Rick and Morty angle on this is pretty stupid and it's one of the few moments in the show where I was like, come on guys. I do agree with comedian Stuart Lee take on political correctness though and I think it's a really brilliant summation and one that aligns perfectly with my own views. Now one hesitates in the current climate to make a joke on stage about the Muslims right not for fear of religious reprisals right when's that ever hurt anyone but, <laughs> but because of a slightly more slippery anxiety which is like basically when you do like stand up in a small room it's like uh, we're all friends, really, and we can make a joke, but you don't really know you don't really know how a joke's received, and it could be that it's laughed at enthusiastically in a way that you don't understand, and particularly out there, and if you don't know who's watching in television, I mean, if it's on telly on Paramount, probably someone horrible, an idiot. So you don't know, because the problem, the problem is, 84% of people, apparently, of the public, think that political correctness has gone mad. Now, um, I don't know if it has. People still get killed, don't they, for being the wrong colour or the wrong sexuality or whatever. And what is political correctness? It's, a, it's an often clumsy negotiation towards a kind of formally inclusive language. And there's, there's all sorts of problems with it, but it's better than what we had before. But 84% of people think political correctness has gone mad. And you don't want one of those people coming up to you after the gig and going, well done, mate. Uh, well done, actually, for having a go at the fucking Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> well done, mate. You know, you can't do anything in this country anymore, mate. It's political correctness gone mad. You know, you can't even write racial abuse in excrement on someone's car <laughs> without the politically correct brigade <laughs> jumping down your throat. And you, you don't want those people coming up to you after gigs because that's Al Murray, the pub landlord's audience. <laughs> Missing the point and laughing through bared teeth like the dogs they are. Roger Ebert said of film that We are all born with a certain package. We are who we are, where we were born, who we were born as, how we were raised. We're kind of stuck inside that person. And the purpose of civilization and growth is to be able to reach out and empathize a little bit with other people. And for me, the movies are like a machine that generates empathy. It lets you understand a little bit more about different hopes, aspirations, dreams, and fears. It helps us to identify with the people who are sharing this journey with us. To me, one of the highest functions of art is for it to help people feel less alienated. I get critique and satire and attacking power structures, but when you're talking about throwing around slurs and deliberately offending and hurting everyone, including people who are having a pretty rough time, why would you want to knowingly put something out there that makes downtrodden people feel more alienated and unwelcome instead of less? I am in no way advocating for the total removal of certain topics from criticism or from discussion. Like, people who say you can never joke about certain topics are wrong. Maybe you feel good saying nobody should ever joke about rape, but in saying that, you're cutting off people from talking about their own experiences of sexual assault or fears of being sexually assaulted, and others from criticizing rape culture. I've been in rooms where a comic made a joke about the death of a parent, and I'm the only one really laughing, and my dad is, like, super dead. I enjoy dark humor because I've been through a lot of dark experiences and those jokes resonate with me. A lot of how I dealt with the horrible trauma of my father's death was through morbid humor. People can be weird and precious about certain topics they feel are taboo, even when the way those topics are being handled in that moment is progressive and constructive and intelligent, and I find that really annoying. If you're confident in your beliefs, then you're not going to be too afraid to laugh at something out of fear of offending others. But at the same time, criticism 
of a joke or not laughing at a joke is not censorship. Someone holding a mic or uploading a video doesn't mean they're above criticism, and jokes that punch down and target marginalized groups are harmful and alienating. Progressives who blanketly condemn all jokes involving rape are, to me, wrong, but I get why they have the urge to do it. Since rape jokes that are like, ha, a uh, slut had it coming, make rapists more comfortable, and that describes the majority of rape jokes I've heard. If your humor makes people who hate certain groups or people who rape more comfortable, like if you're affirming their beliefs with your jokes, then maybe you should be rethinking your jokes and not consider people who call you an unfunny bully an affront to free speech. Because if you actually listen instead of being defensive, you can learn and grow and improve. I'm not even saying you have to agree with people and do exactly what they say. I just want you to have more empathy and to take critique into consideration instead of dismissing it. I think people who get really deep into media as identity, and I mean people on both the far right and on the far left, take a low integrative complexity all or nothing approach. As if being able to enjoy something and still criticize it is either capitulating to and endorsing bigots or a sign of SJW sensitivity and weakness. Though honestly, the people who get freaked out about SJWs remind me of people who scream about white genocide in response to Cheerios commercials. I've experienced Tumblr and I've experienced 4chan and lots of people on the internet are hypersensitive weirdos who throw tantrums and dox people they don't agree with, but when you get down to it and you leave the realm of the extreme fringe, I vastly prefer to side with a group that is overall, however clumsily, calling for more empathy, not less. And there's a balance with problematic media the same way there's a balance with problematic artists. I'm not super big on gotcha call-out posts about artists generally, unless it's for something really heinous, like allegedly pulling your dick out and cornering women, or raping someone, or generally for being a fundamentally abusive or harmful person. If you operate on the call-out wavelength, and you read posts I made when I was a dumb teen where I jokingly called my friends gay or whatever, you'd probably think I was a bad person too. It does not allow for growth. But then you have people on the other end who will excuse any kind of behavior and complain about call-out culture when people have legitimate criticisms. It's important to be able to criticize art or artists so that art can grow and so that people can grow. Or so that if someone is a legitimately terrible, abusive person, that they will no longer have the power to abuse. I don't care about convoluted personal drama or the mildly unwoke stuff someone might have said when they were a teenager, but I also don't care how long ago it was that Polanski raped a girl, and it's disgusting that he still has a career. He is a tremendous artist, and I think his films are incredible, but that doesn't make him above criticism or deserving of my ticket money. Ultimately, you're not obligated to feel a certain way while watching a piece of art. And to me, there's a difference between consuming art with a critical mind with regard to what you're taking in and supporting versus mindlessly supporting and enabling an abuser or a piece of art that will have a net negative impact. You just have to leave room for nuance and for productive conversation and for fixing missing stairs, which, as someone who has gotten caught and hurt by missing stairs in the past, is really, really important. In consumption and support is responsibility, and you're deluding yourself when you say it's just a joke or just a TV show because jokes and shows demonstrably shape how we think and feel. Whether it's with your viewership or your vocal support or your money, when you watch or pay for or spread something, that's an endorsement of that material. If you keep buying tickets to see movies that are bigoted or that were made by abusive people, Hollywood's gonna keep making bigoted movies and giving abusive people jobs. It's only by calling out and expressing distaste for bigoted material that we can enact any kind of change on that material. So criticism is healthy and should be welcomed, and you don't need to flip out about the PC police when someone's like, wow, that's kind of racist. You can pretend all day if you want that media and identity politics and representation don't matter and that there are more important things in the world to worry about, as if caring about one thing and caring about another thing are somehow mutually exclusive. But that's disingenuous and it ignores how big a role art plays in our lives and in our culture. Barring straight up hate speech, you also have the right to say what you want and watch what you want, and while I might criticize it, I'm not going to waste my finite time on earth policing what you do or hypocritically insisting you only consume the wokest media. You just need to be aware of whether what you're doing day to day is enabling or supporting abusers or enabling or supporting rhetoric that hurts people and really consider who or what you want to support with your time and with your money. You also need to be aware of who you're giving influence over your heart and your brain to. That awareness, and it at least being a factor in your behavior and in your media consumption, is more important than what shows you like. If you enjoyed this, please consider donating to my Patreon so I can keep making video essays like this one. Links to everything I referenced are in the description. Thanks to the friends who helped me out with this essay, and thanks for watching! There's a spider, spider. It's deep in my soul, soul. He's lived here for years, years. He just won't let go. He's laying around. He's got a mean bite. Now he's ready to fight.
spitting. I'm spitting at them. <laughs> Is that the sign? Spit. 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 Hey, you! 